Hi everybody, this is section 11 of the novel 910 by Nora Raleigh Baskin. And our setting today is still September 10th, but we are at 2.10 p.m. Pacific time. And that means we're in Los Angeles with Amy. The last class of Amy's first day at her new school was her least favorite, physical education. Amy considered opting out by claiming low blood sugar from involuntary fasting, but she decided against starting out the year as the class hypochondriac. Okay, so we've talked about this before. The idea that in Amy's section we see a lot of hyperbolic uh, language, that she exaggerates a lot. She's a very dramatic character, and using hyperbole is how the author helps us build and understand this character. So... Uh, Amy considered opting out by claiming low blood sugar from involuntary fasting. So this makes reference to the fact that seventh grade lunch period for Amy is at 10 o'clock in the morning. She chose not to eat anything. And now she's very, very hungry. Uh, this term right here, hypochondriac, is someone who has a mental condition where even though they may be physically well, they imagine that they are sick in some way. So uh, she's acknowledging in this one sentence that, you know, she feels like she's going to pass out because she hasn't eaten anything, but that might be a bit of an exaggeration. It might make her appear to be, um, you know, a little bit extra, a little too much, okay? Besides, everyone else looks so excited to be outside in the scorching Los Angeles heat. She didn't want to call attention to herself. She figured she could just blend in. Although out here in the bright sun, which was reaching higher into the sky, the other students' hair looked even blonder. And in shorts, they all looked like Olympic track stars. Tan Olympic stars. Okay, everyone, you can socialize later. I'll give you time at the end of the period. Right now, line up into the same teams we made last week. The gym instructor was a ridiculously good-looking young teacher named Tom Cruise. For real. But maybe it wasn't spelled that way. Of course, Amy had no idea where to stand as the other kids started to separate themselves into two, te two teams, meandering their way to one end of the grassy area or the other. If she didn't move, she'd end up right in the middle like a monkey, like a hot roasted monkey. It wasn't that hot, to tell the truth. It was exactly as Amy's mother had promised, mild and dry, perfect Southern California weather. So this kind of makes reference to the game Monkey in the Middle, if you've ever played, where, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a mean game, really. Uh, you know, you, you basically are trying to keep the ball away from the person in the middle. Um, and so she doesn't want to be in that kind of situation where she stands out. And where was her mother now? In New York City, probably looking at studio apartments to rent for herself. Now, is this true? Is mom really looking for apartments to rent? No. This is Amy's imagination getting the better of her. Because, let's remember, that she's feeling sorry for herself today. And so she's imagining that what Vanessa and Bridget have said is actually true. Amy, over here, a voice shouted. It was Bridget, minus Vanessa. Amy could make out what she was saying. Come on to my team. Bridget was waving her arms and mouthing. Amy didn't need to be asked twice. She rushed over to her left and merged into the group of kids Bridget was standing with. Thanks, Amy told her gratefully. Jim turned out to be not so horribly bad, even on an empty stomach. In fact, it was kind of fun and it took Amy's mind off food. Bridget turned out to be pretty nice. They ran crazy relay races without winners because that apparently was another thing about California. Everyone is a winner. When she caught her breath, Amy thought about what she would tell her mother on the phone when she got home. I think I might have made a friend. Her name is Bridget. Until Vanessa showed up right before the end of the period, just when, as promised, 
Tom Cruise gave the class a few minutes to socialize. Bridget and Amy were sitting cross-legged on the ground. What are you two doing? Vanessa sat down right between them, even though it would have made more sense for her to sit where there was much more room next to Amy. Bridget had to shift over to make space. Just talking, she answered ever so quietly. Are you in this class too? Amy asked Vanessa. Yes, Vanessa answered, but I know what you're doing. Bridget let her eyes fall like there was something incredibly interesting crawling around in the grass. Doing? Amy asked. What am I doing? You're reacting to your mom and dad splitting up by trying to steal someone else's best friend. Mine. I see right through you. The words were so nonsensical. Amy thought it must be some movie business tradition. The way boys were always reciting lines from movies. Maybe here in California, people did that all the time. Amy tried to figure out what movie that could be from. X-Men? Star Wars? No, she's not. Bridget tried. She kept her head down. She was just telling me about her old school. I'm sure, Vanessa said. Well, everybody knows what happens when the mom is more successful than the dad. Just look at Reese Witherspoon and Ryan Phillippe. How long do you think that's going to last? I mean, what has he even done since Cruel Intentions? So here we see Vanessa is making a comparison between what's going on in Amy's family and an acting couple who, believe it or not, actually did end up getting divorced. Um... But basically, Vanessa's, again, driving home that idea of the mom and dad splitting up. And she actually accuses Amy of trying to steal Bridget from her, which goes to show some real insecurity. If you have to guard your best friend like they're the last slice of pizza on earth, then that's not a stable friendship. You know, you should be able to have friends with more than one person. But uh, apparently Vanessa's a very insecure person, right? So she kind of takes this out right on Amy by saying, you know, everybody knows what happens when the mom is more successful than the dad. Now I'm going to remind you this was 2001 that this is supposed to take place in. So it's a little bit of an antiquated attitude. There are plenty of women out there who are more successful than their husbands financially. And it's fine. It's not a big deal. Let's continue. She leaned in toward Amy and asked, Is there someone else? There's always someone else in cases like this. So now Vanessa, who obviously is heavily into mental manipulation, is asking Amy if Amy's mom is having an affair. And again, there's no proof. Vanessa doesn't know Amy. She doesn't know Amy's mom. She doesn't know Amy's dad. She doesn't know their situation. She's just being mean. She's just trying to get inside of Amy's head and psych her out. And again, insecure people will do things like that. They'll be mean for the sake of being mean because it makes them feel better. So uh, definitely Vanessa is a person that I would not spend too much time with if I were Amy. Let's continue. We have those three little dots. We've seen those before. It means some time passes. So we're probably about an hour later. Amy ran to the phone as soon as she opened her front door and burst into her new house. What she wanted to do was cry and complain and wail and cry some more. What she really wanted was for her mother to be here, right here, right now. After Amy's very worst day in her entire life, hands down, no contest, worst ever. She dialed her mother's mobile number. So very worst day in her entire life. Surprise, surprise. We have more hyperbole. Okay. How was school, sweetie? Her mom's voice sounded so far away. 3,000 miles far away. I'm so sorry I wasn't there, but I'm sure it was great. I'm sure you were great. And slowly... Like the realization that you've just cut yourself on the seemingly harmless piece of paper, it did make sense what Vanessa had been saying. 
Her mom didn't really want to know about her day. She just wanted everything to be great. Great. So her mom didn't have to feel bad that she had to go away to this stupid meeting at the worst possible time for Amy. Her mom didn't want to hear what had really happened. She just wanted to feel good about what she was doing instead of terrible, which was what she should have been feeling. So this is kind of a sad conclusion that Amy realizes. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that it's accurate. But she says that her mom doesn't... Oh, sorry about that. Oof. She says her mom doesn't really want to know about her day because her mom didn't want to have to feel bad. And I think that maybe there are times when uh, the adults in our lives are overwhelmed or they're busy, and it may seem like it's easier to just say, fine, good, everything's okay. But the reality of it is the adults in your life when they love you and they care about you, they really do want to know what's going on. Um, so it seems like maybe Amy's selling her mom short. But again, look, look at who she's referencing. She's going back to the advice Vanessa gave her, right? Fine, Amy answered. It wasn't a very good mobile phone connection, which made it easier for Amy to answer in monosyllables and not have to explain why. She didn't feel like talking to her mom right now. She sure didn't want to listen. So, I'll call you tomorrow morning before my meeting, okay, sweetie? Her mom was saying, before you head off to school again, okay? When? Amy asked. My meeting is at nine o'clock, but it's all the way downtown, her mother told her. It's in the World Trade Center, so Chris and I are going to leave the hotel around eight. Oh, my dears, look at what we have. Nine o'clock, World Trade Center. Hmm. This, my loves, is foreshadowing because we know on September 11th, 2001, just before 9 a.m. at the World Trade Center, a tragedy occurs. Now, obviously Amy doesn't have this knowledge, so this doesn't seem to ring a bell for her, but this part does. Chris and I. Amy had never heard her mother mention anyone at work named Chris. Amy, are you there? Amy, okay? I'll call you before I leave for my meeting. Chris? Mom, that's five in the morning here, Amy heard herself saying. I'll be sleeping. I know, sweetheart. So I'll just leave you a message on the machine like I always do. You don't have to pick up. I just want to say good morning and I love you, okay? Amy felt her throat sting. I love you, Amala her mother said into the phone. And that's when Amy was supposed to answer with the matching Yiddish nickname, I love you too, Mamala. Amy. Can't hear you, Mom, Amy said, holding the phone out away from her mouth. I gotta go. And she hung up. Now, this, this hanging up on her mom, pretending she can't hear her, you got to wonder, is this the way Amy would want to leave a conversation with her mother if she had only known? Because let's keep in mind that we don't ever really know when our last conversation with any loved one is. So this could very well be the very last thing that Amy said to her mother ever. How will she feel growing up knowing that the last conversation with her mom was her blowing her mom off and saying, gotta go, can't hear you, bye. So it's just some interesting insight um, as we consider what's going on in this scene. Now, when we talk about foreshadowing, and if you did your devices the Disney way, you'll know that there's a specific type of foreshadowing that deals just with negative events. And that is called foreboding. And what's important to note is the B in foreboding means something bad is going to occur. We already have the historical knowledge of what's going to happen at the World Trade Center uh, around 9 o'clock in the morning on September 11th. We know that it's a tragic, horrible event. So we know that it's not just foreshadowing that the author is using here. This is a use of foreboding. 
So that is the end of section 11. If I were you, I would definitely jump into Amy's section. It is definitely worth mentioning that, uh, you know, she's allowed Vanessa to once again get into her head. She's assuming that her mother is having an affair when her mother has absolutely no evidence of doing that. Um, and whatever relevant details that you feel you want to add to your chart, just remember a, a fat chart's a happy chart. So add as many details as you think matter from this section. And I'll be back to read with you section 12. Have a good one.